Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the United States Army Cadet Command Third Virtual Town Hall. Our host this evening is Major General John R. Evans, Jr., the Commanding General of United States Army Cadet Command in Fort Knox. Today, he is joined by the Command Sergeant Major of United States Army Recruiting Command, Sergeant, Command Sergeant Major Tabitha Gavia. The subject of this evening's town hall is an open discussion on race. At this point, we will have opening remarks from the commander, Major General Evans. Thanks, uh, thanks Colonel Downs, I appreciate it. Uh, first, let me just say thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm not sure how many folks are gonna have viewing out there. We've blown this up on social media quite a bit. We've tried to get the word out. But I'm, I'm hopeful and, and I'm encouraged by the fact that we've got cadre and cadets that are interested in having this discussion. And so uh, I look forward to having it with you. And I want to recognize uh, and thank Command Sergeant Major Tabitha Gavia for joining me tonight. As most of you know, Cadet Command is without a nominative Command Sergeant Major right now. So I kind of put her on the spot last week and said, hey, would you, be, would you be willing to do this with me? And she jumped right on it and said, yeah. And I think she will bring, uh, obviously, a very interact, interesting perspective to this. So thank you, Sergeant Major, for joining us tonight. So I've got some comments here I'm going to kind of read from, um, but, but I wanted to share a few things with you. So our, our purpose for gathering tonight is, uh, is designed to be a dialogue. Uh, this is not about diversity, but diversity is important. It plays a role in how we address the issue of racism and provides us a tool to broaden the dialogue and seek solutions. Our Army is wonderfully diverse, and we need to continue to celebrate and showcase that. But tonight our dialogue will focus on a harder topic. Army senior leaders are encouraging us to engage in conversation. Uh, the elephant in the room is racism, uh, racial inequity, and racial injustice. And we have to be able to address it responsibly, respectfully, and with open minds. We need to accept that it is an emotional issue for most people. But we can also recognize that this, emotional, this emotion properly channeled can lead to passionate, productive discussions. And I hope that's what we have here tonight. Now, I don't consider racism to be a political issue. It's a human rights issue, a human rights issue. It's a human dignity issue. But we need to understand that politics surround it and in many, in many of the ideas, policies, and constructs in our society that may contribute to systemic racism all have political nuances. So with this acknowledgement, we will do our best to avoid political discussions tonight and try to focus on personal and institutional responsibilities with regards to racism. Additionally, while I think your personal stories will be a powerful part of the dialogue tonight, um, if you are currently experiencing some type of discrimination, I encourage you to speak to your chain of command or your EO representative or get with our team in direct communication after this forum so that we can investigate your complaint and seek remediation. This forum will not be the best way to discuss those specific issues, but we do need to address that. Now we really have three goals tonight and I would ask for you to help us with these as we engage in dialogue. First, listen. This is a safe space and first and foremost, we want to listen to what you have to say and what is on your mind. We'll be responding to questions and comments, but we freely admit that we will not solve the Army or our nation's problems tonight. This is a first step, creating dialogue and listening to everyone. Second, we want to start the conversation. We'll do our best here to provide an acceptable method for how subordinate leaders at Echelon can engage in similar forms at smaller scale to better understand the members of your squad, your team, your ROTC program, or your unit. Although I have personally scripted much of my opening statement, we've not scripted answers to any of the questions that you provided bef us before, and we will be honest and candid as we receive your questions and comments tonight on the online forum. And finally, We've got to be open and honest. I firmly believe that the reason why this is a hard discussion isn't because racism is ugly, because we know it is. I believe the reason that this is a hard discussion is because all of us, regardless of the color of our skin, bring our own prejudices and biases with us when we walk into the room. We are products of our environment and a culture that has often suggested to us that we should be mistrustful of someone that doesn't look like us. For that reason, we need to stop and realize that it is often human nature to judge someone almost immediately upon encountering them. So we need to be open and honest in recognizing those biases and fighting through them. Our Army values provide a powerful guide for how we should act to ensure everyone we meet or interacts with 
gets the two things to which all members of our army and our communities are entitled, respect and opportunity. If we can enter our dialogue tonight doing those things, it'll be a good start. And from there, we have to build. We have to continue the conversation and we have to elevate the dialogue so we can take meaningful action to end racism. And with that, I'd like to transition to uh, Sergeant Major Gavia. Thank you, sir. So good evening, teammates. And I'm very appreciative for the opportunity to talk to um, our, our fellow soldiers and cadets in, um, in a sister command. So first, I want to start off by saying racism exists in the Army. That, that's a fact. Now, how we define ourselves is how we approach this, this problem. And it's not a unique problem to the Army or to our country. And as you are aware, there are demonstrations all over the world about racism and race inequities um, that occur in whether it's in our own backyard or as far away as um, Australia. So I wanted to open um, with a personal experience. And I shared this with my command last week on our town hall. And I think it truly speaks to um, a very hard challenge with racism. People fail to even realize that what they're doing is, in fact, racist. So a few years ago, I, I worked for an officer, a white officer. And my first interaction with him, um, I noticed, you know, my first few interactions with him, I noticed that he was treating the soldiers of color differently in, in our section, in our, in our little part of our world. Um, he didn't treat me differently, but I did notice that he treated um, our soldiers of color different. And I, I watched it for a little bit. I watched it for a couple weeks because I, I wanted to make sure, am I wrong about this? Does, does he even know what he's doing? And um, I pulled him aside. We were at a conference for a higher command, and I said, we need to have a conversation. And I explained to him what he was doing and how he was breaking the trust of every soldier that we were responsible for, how he was pulling down the morale, how he was building barriers in between our soldiers simply because he was treating one soldier different from the other. And he was appalled. He was absolutely appalled. And he essentially broke down in front of me. He said, Sergeant Major, no, this is not who I am. And I, I said, that may not be who you are, but this is what you're doing. And so we had to have that hard conversation. And I know it can be hard when you're not in a, a leadership position. So when I first joined the Army, a um, very long time ago, I've been in the Army for quite some time, um, it hit me as soon as I walked in, in, as soon as I walked into my unit. The type of job I had, there were three other persons of color in my platoon, and every other person was a Caucasian male. I was very fortunate. My squad leader explained to me how the Army is and ensured that we were surrounded by people that knew what right is. What does right look like? And he was fearless. I will never forget that gentleman. He was absolutely fearless. And he approached it a different way than I do. I had the, the calm conversation. He was actually in your face. This is, this is not right. This is not what we're going to do. And you're going to treat everybody fairly. And I think that boils down, that's what it boils down to. You treat every single person with dignity and respect no matter where they come from, no matter what their sex is, no matter what um, their ethnicity is. Because if you don't, you break the trust down. Now, General Evans said something about our roles, was our individual roles and the roles of our unit in this. As an individual, we have a responsibility to address this. We have a responsibility to ensure that the people that surround us understand how we feel, understand the things that we need to do to make a difference, to make that change. And this is hard. 
it's very hard to have that uncomfortable conversation. And I will tell you, as a person of color and as a female, it's been very hard in the Army. I will also tell you that we are much better than we were 32 years ago when I was in, I was just leaving basic training. We are much better. But we, we do have a ways to go. We do. And I think we can get there together. The Army's number one priority, Chief of Staff, Secretary of the Army, people first. And you can clearly see that in the Army's people strategy. And if you haven't read it, I ask that each and every one of you take the time to read the Army's people strategy, particularly line of effort one, which is acquire talent, which is what we do. And if you're a cadet, is what you live. So please take the time to read that. General Evans also spoke about, uh, this is my squad. This is my squad. We treat everyone, again, with dignity and respect. And we have those hard conversations. And not just with people that look like us. You have to have the hard conversations with people that look differently from you. Because what you're viewing as racism, and we know what the AR 600-20, Army Command's policy, what it says racism is, we all know that definition. But how you interpret that is maybe completely different than how I interpret it. The other way that you address this is through mentorship. You should have peer mentors, senior mentors, and junior mentors to have this conversation with. You surround yourself with good people to have this conversation with, this hard conversation. And then when you find that it exists, then as a leader in the United States Army, you have to do something about it. You have to address it. You have to tackle this. Because by ignoring it, it does not go away. It festers. It gets under your skin. And it's what makes soldiers cry themselves to sleep at night. It's what makes soldiers leave the army. It's what makes, in, in some cases, leads to misconduct. So we have to have these very hard uh, conversations. I wanted to share with you, uh, I am a nominative star major. General Evans mentioned that. So what, not, what that means is that I work for a general officer. And I, I've been in positions like this for the last five years, so I'm very familiar with uh, how the system works. So this week was the annual nominative uh, training conference with the SMA. And today we had the opportunity to listen to the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army talk exactly about this, about owning your squad. So this is my squad as a metaphor. We're not talking about you know, E1, just E1s and E5s led by a staff sergeant. We're talking about everyone. So your squad is your classroom. Your squad is staff call. Your squad is your battalion, headquarters. That's what we're talking about, this is your squad. And each and every leader and follower, we have to wrap our arms around each other and have these hard conversations. We will treat everybody with dignity and respect. We cannot break down the trust of the people that we lead. We cannot lose the trust of the people that we serve beside. So for those folks that are in denial and you say, there's nothing wrong, there is something wrong. We are all not green. We are many different colors many different races, and each and every one of us needs to be treated with dignity and respect, and our background needs to be honored. And if there's one message that you take away from me today, I want you to think long and hard about that mentorship. And you can find that outside your command, you can find that inside your command. It's a senior person, it may even be a junior person, and it's definitely a peer. So you can have those hard conversations. So while we're speaking today, in this format, the real breakthrough happens when it's two, three, four people having that discussion about what we would like our Army to look like, how we would like our Army to be, where we see our challenges with our Army. What can we do better? As an individual, what can you do better? What can you do from your lens to make this better? And so I'm calling each and every one of you, as well as 
the people in our command. We need to come together, bond together, and tackle this very real problem facing us. And so with that, sir, again, thank you for having me today and questions. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Great. Okay, go ahead, Nicole. <clears throat> Our format tonight will begin with questions submitted in advance of the town hall. Similar questions may be grouped together for brevity purposes. We will answer one question at a time and then take questions submitted live online. We will continue answering questions until our allotted time is complete. So, sir, the first question is for you. I was in basic camp not too long ago, and I was very unhappy when we were being briefed and the drill sergeants only spoke about the good things in America. I would ask the question, why can't drill sergeants and other teachers slash leaders also talk about the bad truth behind our country and its leaders? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think that's something we need to focus on a little bit. So, you know, part of what we try to do in, uh, in any type of initial entry training is we try to motivate the team, whether that's a young soldier coming to basic uh, training or whether it's a cadet coming to basic camp or advanced camp. And so I think sometimes we get a little caught up in uh, talking about the good and, and really not focusing on some of the some of the warts that are out there for us. Uh, and I think as we take a look at, you know, leadership in particular, um, we have to acknowledge that even some of our most revered leaders had flaws. Uh, certainly as you look back to the founding fathers, uh, because I know that was part of uh, the, the question that uh, Colonel Downs didn't ask. You know, you've got people there that, that were slave owners. You've got people there that accepted institutional racism as a way of life. Uh, and uh, I think we've got to acknowledge that, hey, even the best of our leaders or the ones that we are revering have got problems and got issues, and we need to bring that out there and make people feel comfortable in that dialogue uh, and not feel awkward about it because uh, we don't get better if we don't discuss the things that are wrong. So, you know, that's what I would offer, and I'll, I'll ask the Sergeant Major if she's got something to add there. So I would, I would just say that um, it's human nature not to speak about things that aren't pleasant. And uh, it's, we need to overcome that. We need to talk about those things that make us uncomfortable. Sir, this next question is also for you. Can minority cadets who are not contracted be involved in the peaceful protest? Yeah, so, so the, the simple answer is absolutely. And, and not just non-contracted, any cadet, any cadre member can be involved in the peaceful protest. Now, you can't wear your uniform while you're doing that because that would uh, then imply that the Army is supporting um, certain things that may or may not be uh, party to that, that protest. I think we've got to encourage people to get out and be heard. And I know we've had a number of cadets that have reached out to me or to the staff that have talked about their experience in doing that. Again, what you do want to try to stay away from is when sometimes these peaceful protests get a little emotional and we start to see things expand a little bit uh, and uh, we see unfortunate situations with violence, that's something you don't want to be involved with uh, because that could lead to some type of disciplinary action for us, for any of our active duty soldiers. But peaceful protests, uh, that's a First Amendment right that you've got and I would encourage you to, uh, to exercise it. Uh, Toby, I've got my JAG here. You got anything to add to that? No, sir. No, I, I agree 100%. You, we encourage the protest. We encourage participation in it. We encourage you to, number one, as General Evans said, not be in your uniform, not to draw back or tie in your affiliation with the Army with the protest so that it's confused in people's minds as to whether the Army is officially supporting this act. And then again, as you indicated, sir, not to, not to break the law, not to do anything illegal that would then um, run afoul, not of First Amendment principles, but maybe legal issues that we may have to take action on as a result. But if, as long as you comply with those, then it is, in, it is a wonderful thing for you to go out and be heard and to, and to participate in those types of things. Sir, Major, thoughts? So what I would add is that um, risk to force is very important to us. And we ask that you be very safe and that you do not go alone, that you, um, you have an um, accountability partner. So as you're participating in this, that um, your safety is definitely our, our number one priority. So be safe there and ensure that other folks, um, your mentors perhaps, or family members know that you're, you're, you're going to do this and take somebody with you. Great point, great point. So the next question says, 
Is there any initiative to rename Army garrisons that are named after Confederate members? I understand the strategy of naming installations after Confederate members in an effort to reconcile the country after the Civil War. However, many Americans, including myself, think that naming Army installations after former Confederate members marginalizes the despicable practice of slavery and the institutional racism that followed. I believe renaming these Army these Army establishments will send a message as an institution that we believe these racist practices are not merely a time frame in American history, but a black stain in our nation's history that in no way meets the high standards of excellence we pursue in today's Army. Yeah, so I can tell you, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give the Sergeant Major an opportunity to opine on this as well, I can tell you that I've had personal conversations with the senior most generals in our Army about this very thing. Uh, advocating for us to take uh, an opportunity to look at this and figure out what we can do. I can tell you that uh, Army senior leaders uh, have, have been discussing this topic actively. Um, I will tell you it probably doesn't rest exclusively with the Army to have autonomy over making that decision. So there are other leaders, senior leaders, that will be involved in that decision. Uh, and right now, I think there are members of Congress that are dealing with this as well. So the answer is yes, there's an active dialogue about this that's been re-energized. It's not the first time it's come up, but it's been re-energized of late. Uh, and those conversations are going on, but I can't tell you what the outcome of that's going to be. And I can't give you a timeline for when that might occur. And sir, Major. So, sir, absolutely. So uh, today, uh, as we were having discussions with the Army senior leaders, uh, that question was brought up and that's definitely under review. But as General Evans stated, this is not, you know, only the Army's decision. So so we're definitely the Army senior leaders are definitely reviewing it. And do you believe that this is a source of pain that that, that we need to take a look at and perhaps make changes? So the next question says, as a future officer and person of color myself, who gets called a terrorist out of uniform due to skin pigmentation, how can I help the Army overcome institutional racism that might be ingrained in some and lead my troops in a unifying fashion against this age-old battle? I would love to see this more involved in our curriculum. Sir, Mid, you want to take that one first? So, um... I have to, uh, first, I, I, I have to admit that I, I don't know exactly what is involved in the curriculum for, um, for ROTC. But I will say this, that across um, um, TRADOC, that we're looking at changing uh, our training for, for not just for professional military education, but also for um, equal opportunity and other venues where we discuss, um, we have these hard conversations. We don't think the way it is, it's right, right now. It obviously isn't. And so we need to basically, you know, review the whole system and how we train our folks to, to tackle these problems. So I will say that um, General Funk and Sergeant Major Gooden have made this uh, a priority and, um, and I, I'm fairly certain they'll be reflected in the um, ROTC curriculum as well. Yeah, I'll add, um, Sergeant Major's right. I mean, we're, we're looking holistically at this right now. Some of this is based on, uh, frankly, an overdue review of some of these issues. Some of it's based on a GAO report that came out recently that, uh, that showed that uh, uh, with regards to some elements of what we're doing in the Army, whether it's military justice or other things, there may be an unconscious bias that's going on. Uh, that we need, we absolutely need to address. So we're reviewing those reports, and we're also reviewing our training methodology. I'll be the first one to tell you, even as a two-star general with 32 years of service, that uh, despite the best efforts of some very talented folks, sometimes our equal opportunity training is not the most engaging thing out there. Uh, it's hard to get soldiers to buy in often. Uh, it's, it's hard to get leaders to promote it in the ways that we want them to. I think everybody wants to promote the idea of uh, equal opportunity, but we've got to do something, I think, that's more uh, versatile with regards to the training. And I think some of it starts with, you know, having these types of conversations about the hard topics and not just about what the reporting procedure is or the fact that the DOTI says and, and the Alarac says we treat everybody the same, you know, regardless of their, um, you know, national origin, color, creed, uh, religion, uh, sexual orientation, or gender. Uh, we've got to have those conversations. So we, we are definitely looking at that. And like the Sergeant Major said, the uh, TRADOC commander, General Funk, 
Command Sergeant Major Gooden are committed to, uh, to moving that forward. Sir, Sergeant Major, either one of you can answer this question. The next question is why hasn't Army ROTC taken a stance on the Black Lives Matter movement? Okay, since I kind of own Army ROTC, I'll take that one. Hey, look, it's a great question. Um, look, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that the Black Lives Matter movement has been incredibly powerful in increasing the narrative, in increasing um, uh, awareness, uh, in rallying people to support behind the cause, in raising awareness across our country, uh, certainly across the racial divide about what's going on with racism in America. Um, but having said that, uh, the, the Army's problem is we can't advocate or support one group or another, uh, frankly, because we're not allowed to by regulation. It doesn't mean we don't advocate the idea or appreciate the idea, uh, because I believe that all lives have inherent value, um, and uh, Black Lives Matter is certainly uh, one of those groups that's promoting that ideal. But uh, if we you know, find ourselves endorsing Black Lives Matter, then some other maybe less a respectable organization should come along and want endorsement, we'd be in a position where we might have to consider that endorsement. And so the Army and DOD kind of steers clear of doing those types of things for what we call non-federal entities. Uh, and I believe they're a 501c3 nonprofit, which would make them a non-federal entity. So, so that's why we've not done that. I'm glad to see the CG take the lead on this conversation. So many times in a unit, or here at school, a certain first class gets stuck with teaching an EO class and all the other cadre don't necessarily teach. They just chime in with some Army values comments and nothing happens. My question is what can be done about getting more diverse representation for regimental training officer pos positions at advanced camp or at least the regimental XO positions? Yeah, so, so this is a good question, and it's a broad question that opens up the aperture a little bit on, on how we are doing with officer diversity. Uh, and specifically on the officer side, we're not doing as well as we need to do. Uh, we, we realize that. We're trying to apply resources and techniques against that, but we've got to do better. If you take a look at the representation, and these are rough figures, and Sergeant Major Gavia knows them. She might correct me if I get something wrong here, but... If you take a look at our, our population, about 16 to 17 percent is African American. I'll take Af African American as an example. Um, if you take a look at our Army, we're at about 19 to 21 percent, depending on where you draw your data from. So that would lead you to believe, hey, we're pretty well represented. You know, as a minority group in the Army, we are overrepresented against the population. The, the problem is um, it's a little off balance. In the officer corps, we are closer to uh, somewhere around 11 to 12 percent. So what we want to be able to do is build teams where the soldiers can look up and see someone that looks like them, that's had their same life experience, that understands culturally where they come from. Uh, and we're trying to do that in a lot of different areas right now. We, we specifically suffer from this with regards to combat arms. And so for my young officers or uh, cadets out there of color who are considering what they need to branch, I'm encouraging you to consider the combat arms because we need help making that group more diverse holistically. As you take a look at the five or, well, or six branches that we really consider the traditional combat arms, it speaks directly to why sometimes we don't have uh, as much diversity with regards to our regimental tax or executive officers as we would like to have. It's because we just don't have enough representation within the command to do that. Um, I'm very happy with, uh, I'm not happy with, I'm very uh, proud of the fact that we have great diversity uh, in uh, Cadet Command, because if you take a look across our PMSs, you take a look across our APMSs, our SMIs, uh, and MSIs, we've got a, a good amount of diversity there. We can always do better, and we need to do better. So I'm asking for your help, cadre and cadets, to encourage young men and women of color to look at different uh, branches than what we've traditionally seen. That will help us get at this problem, but this is not a solve tomorrow type problem. This is a culture that we need to start adjusting to and it's a conversation we need to start having, particularly within the combat arms community and the special op operations community, that's my tribe, uh, about making sure that we are open and welcoming to people that don't historically look like uh, the officers that have filled those roles. And I think this is something we gotta continue to push and I can tell you, um, General Funk is engaged on this, the Chief of Staff of the Army is engaged on it, the Secretary of the Army is engaged on it, and we're looking at ways to increase that all the time. So, 
So uh, we actually have a, um, a group that meets periodically, uh, the Army's People's Strategy, and the Acquire Talent. And it is led by the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Men, Power, and Reserve Affairs, Dr. Wardinsky. And it is a topic that we discuss and have uh, working towards um, ex expanding it. So we, we need people of color to choose the maneuver and fires route. So, um, and, and generally speaking, uh, we don't. We usually go into um, to, uh, to other fields. And there's a variety of reasons for that. It depends on you know, who you speak to and family background and, and what their interests are. I would say this, so I'm going to give you my, my, uh, my, uh, my two cents on this. We need you to help us lead the Army. The way to do that is maneuver and fires. The way to do that is infantry, armor, artillery, um, aviation, and um, an armor. That's the way to do it. Uh, and, and so we, we need you to, we're asking you to take a look at that and, and see yourself. See yourself in General Garrett's shoes. Um, and many of you, you know your history, see yourself in General Lloyd's shoes. See yourself in General Campbell's shoes. See yourself in, um, although not maneuver and fires, definitely one of the most amazing leaders I've ever encountered, a physician. By the way, we need tons of those too. See yourself in General West's shoes. So, and that's what we're asking you. We're asking you to choose fields that you will continue to grow in your career um, to lead the Army at the three and four star general level and the nominative commencement our major level. No, and, and I'll tell you, what, and Sergeant Major's dead on with this. I, I know this is hard, folks. I know it's hard to want to go be part of a team where you are going to be a smaller minority than you already are. I get that. And we are trying to remove barriers uh, to entry to do that. But we've got to have some brave souls that step out there and want to do this because, uh, you know, when you, talk, you listen to General Garrett talk, you listen to retired General Austin talk, uh, retired General Brooks talk about this, um, you know, if you want to be a senior leader in our United States Army, uh, the bottom line is it really comes down to four branches. I mean, we, we're going to get an MI person every now and then, a logistician every now and then, and a couple of others, but infantry, armor, artillery, and aviation is kind of how we're doing it now. That could change, uh, but we don't have enough density there. So I would encourage all of you to consider that. And, um, and, and let me put my plug in for aviation right now, too. I'm an aviator. We don't have enough African-American representation in aviation. Um, to pre-qualify so that you can put that on your branching sheet, you need to take the SIF test, you need to get a flight physical. If you want to be an aviator, go tell your PMS, I want a flight physical, I want to take the SIF test, and let's get that done so that we provide aviation branch a broader bench to draw from so that we can help correct some of these issues that have been a little systemic for us. So, sir, I, I wanted to make one more comment. So, at the beginning of your questions, you, you laid out the background for your question. You talked about the EO training that you received. <clears throat> I, I would challenge every leader in cadet command that your EO training needs to be like a round table. Do away with the, um, the PowerPoint slides and, and the, the E7 that gets tag your it to teach this class, your, your equal opportunity a representative or leader in that organization. I would challenge every leader, you sit down and have that conversation about equal opportunity within your own organization. So I'll move to the next question, and each of you can answer this one based on your position. Since you've been in your position, how many racially involved cases have you had um, come to your desk? Uh, it, uh, cases where race was involved or racism or some type of discrimination? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so several. Um, I can remember at least four, and this is a good opportunity for me to talk a little bit about people, people's behavior. I can remember at least four cases with ROTC cadets that we investigated, uh, each of which led to the disenrollment of that cadet. And this was because they were affiliating themselves with um, organizations that were advocating uh, white supremacy or other type of uh, activity that was, was in my viewpoint, uh, racist. Uh, and frankly, I get some latitude in my viewpoint. Uh, so, you know, people have their First Amendment rights to be able to speak out and have constructive dialogue, but if you are aligning yourself 
with someone who is not aligned with our Army values, you are putting yourself at risk. Uh, we've also had a couple of instances of cadre as well, uh, but uh, in, in every case, uh, we, we've had very good investigations that have been done, and I think we've had good dispositions on those. So um, I want to say this, um, the case that comes to mind immediately, I want to say it was in uh, the fall of 18. We had uh, three young men um, that were about to graduate high school. Um, they were enrolled in our delayed entry program. They're our future soldiers. And they decided to dress up for KKK for Halloween. And um, we, of course, we, you know, we cannot have extremism in the Army, and so we, we terminated their contract with the Army. So that is the, um, the only one that I can recall related to our depths. We've had several related to um, people um, in, our, in our formation with saying inappropriate things. Um, and even, I know, in one case I remember it was on purpose. Um, it was like borderline and the person was doing it, uh, this is what the investigator found, was doing it to get a rise out of the, the young person that was the target. So when we handle it appropriately, there's no room for that. Um, if you cannot treat everyone with dignity and respect, and if you um, purposely go about to harm other folks, then there's no room for you in the Army. And I, I would just say that we, we handle it appropriately. Sergeant Major, I'll start with you with this question. Many feel the boat has left the dock regarding now addressing this issue from senior Army leadership. What was, what was the purpose in a delayed response to the force if nothing ever happened to George Floyd and the outcry from <clears throat> Americans and soldiers, would we be meeting today over this issue we already knew existed? I had a hard conversation with a, a, a young person in our formation about three weeks ago, and that was exactly her question. And I explained to her that uh, we are a department, we are a, a subordinate department to the Department of Defense. And so uh, I do not know if this is actually the case, but this is from my years of leadership. I, I believe that our response came because we were waiting on the Department of Defense's response. That's what I believe. I could be completely wrong about that, but I mean, it it's works in this how the military works, you know. So, the you know General Evans is not going to get out ahead of General Funk. Um, the brigade commander is not going to get ahead of General General Evans, and and so that that's what I believe. Now, about um, Mr. Floyd, do I think that we would be having this conversation if that hadn't occurred? I don't know if we would be having this conversation now, but we would have been having the conversation because I think that it became a tipping point. I think that um, it's, you know, it's kind of corny saying, but the straw that broke the camel's back. Mr. Floyd, obviously his life is, is, is not, you know, a straw, but um, something else would have occurred to, to spark this. I truly believe that. And if you look across the country, there are instances that are coming to light where, um, you know, similar cases to Mr. F uh, Mr. Floyd's, e even this year. So um, that's what I believe that, you know, what you consider a delay in the Army's response, what I consider is a careful consideration based on what the senior leaders, um, above Army senior leaders, um, their actions for us to, to act. And as for the um, Mr. Floyd, I do believe that we've been having this discussion, maybe not this point in time, but certainly it was coming. And I, I think that um, even, you know, um, when you look around at the, the folks that you work with, the folks, folks you go to school with, um, and have this conversation, I think we can all agree that, that it's been coming. S sir? Yeah, so um, I'll agree in part with uh, the Sergeant Major, but I would tell you that um, I think, had we not had the catalyst of Mr. Floyd's death, we wouldn't be having the conversation the way we are now. Uh, and that's not to do any discredit to our Army senior leaders. I consider myself a senior leader in my formation. Uh, it, it's just that um, often when we don't have a catalyzing event like that, we, we just, we've got so much going on, we just think that 
the world's working the way it's supposed to and that all of our soldiers are happy and everybody's being productive and there aren't any issues there. And I think one of the things this has done for me as a Caucasian male, it has really turned the light on for me with regards to the fact that we're not looking deep enough at some of this stuff. We're not asking hard questions of our teammates, of our leaders. Um, and, and frankly, you know, uh, to their great credit, a lot of our leaders, you know, our subordinate leaders, they don't want to bring things to the CG or the Command Sergeant Major. They want to handle it at their level. But uh, it's apparent they've got to have some help. Uh, and I think the Chief and the Secretary of the SMA are all at that place right now understanding, hey, we've got, we've got to address this. We need to help the force. We've got to help it with guidance. We've got to help it with instruction. Uh, and we've got to help it by, by creating the dialogue. And, and that's why we're doing this tonight. You know, the senior leaders of the Army said, start having a dialogue with your folks. Well, I don't, I don't have a motor pool where I can put all of Cadet Command and have a discussion. This is the best I can do. But we want to have this dialogue tonight, and I think it's important. But, but I've got to be intellectually honest. I think if Mr. Floyd had not been killed, um, we would still be kind of rowing the boat in the same direction right now until we got to another catalyzing event, like the Sergeant Major talked about. So... Um, so, you know, we, we've, we've got we've to keep having the conversation. We've got we've to look deeper at the things that we're doing. So, sir, I think this is a great follow-on question to that. How can I start an effective and educational conversation about racism with my battalion or leadership? What can I do to ensure that my battalion has a safe space to talk about social issues like race? Yeah. So I think the first thing you have to do is you, you, you get together and you kind of acknowledge that uh, it's an emotional issue, it's filled with a lot of passion, but you've got to have some ground rules for the discussion, right? You've got to say, hey, this has got to be a respectful dialogue, and everybody's got a viewpoint, you've got to be able to share it, and everybody's got to open their ears up and listen to that viewpoint. Um, I think with regards to how you start to have the conversation, you start by kind of what I said in my opening comments, which is acknowledging that everybody walks into the room with prejudices and biases. I don't care how you were raised, where you come from, how good or clean or pure you think you are. There are things that occurred during your developmental and foundational years that influence the way you think about people. We almost immediately make judgments when we see people, right or wrong, conscious or unconscious, it happens. You've got to acknowledge that up front because if you don't, then you're blind to what you may be doing. As Sergeant Major Gavia pointed out, she had a, uh, and she's told me this story before, the officer she told me, she said she didn't think was a bad guy, uh, but he had, he had no idea that he was treating people this way because he couldn't acknowledge that those prejudices and biases were somehow ingrained in him. Uh, they're ingrained in all of us and we have to do it. I have to check myself, um, you know, to, to and step back and look at the facts and evaluate people and comments and commentary and content based on, you know, its merits and not based on an arbitrary you know, uh, skin color, gender, sexual orientation, or anything else. So I think you have to, that's how you have to start the conversation. Lay out some ground rules to say, hey, we're going to have this conversation. It's going to be tough. It might be emotional and passionate, but remember to be respectful to everybody. And then let's share and let's listen. And I, I actually have a, a recommendation. Uh, I, I think our, our third brigade um, commands our major uh, Crowfoot and uh, Colonel uh, Lopez did this very well. So um, they too were struggling with how do we have this conversation. So they built a forum and then they asked for, for would you please you know, participate? We would like you to participate. And what are your questions? And to start it off. So what are your questions even before um, we open the forum up? And they had soldiers from um, across their command um, pour their hearts out. So I agree with everything that General Evans said, but I would also say ask your, ask your teammates uh, what their questions are. Ask them what, what they're feeling. Ask them if they're in pain. Ask them about their personal experiences because you, you just don't know. You don't know what, what I experienced today. You, you may assume that my life is amazing because I smile all the time but you just don't know. So I think that's the start to the conversation with your teammates. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna move to some questions from online live. How are we encouraging more women, especially African-American women retiring from the Army to become junior ROTC instructors? Sir, this is for you. 
Yeah, so um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that we've got a targeted approach to uh, women and African American women on that, um, and it's probably something we need to look at. Uh, because I think what we find is I look at the junior ROTC instructional pool, it tends to be a lot of white males, uh, not exclusively, it tends to be a lot of males. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to, uh, to uh, maybe not to get women, maybe we have been targeting women. Um, we're working with SFL TAP uh, to broaden our reach across the retiree pool. Currently, to be a junior ROTC instructor, you have to be a, a, a retiree from the active force. We're working to change some of that to build some latitude with the new um, blended retirement system and the ability to look at component two and three, the garden reserve. Uh, but I think that's an area that we've, we've got some work to do. Um, and, uh, and I thank the comment, and we'll take that on and see if we can try to orient that on certain specific individuals. We've got so many females in um, uh, junior ROTC, I think that would be very useful. Sir, Sergeant Major, lately there have been a rise in distrust towards the police and military personnel. What guidance will there be for school cadre and cadets as far as conducting training at schools and communities when the people there may take issue with our presence? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump on that one first. Um, so we, we talk about this quite a bit, you know, the presence of even um, rubber ducks, um, you know, false weapons and things like that can be a very inciting experience uh, on a college campus based on school shootings and things like that. And we, and we, we have that dialogue often. Uh, now this adds a new component to it, a new complexity, obviously, with the, with the fact that the police um, are, are losing some credibility with the American people based on these recent incidents. Uh, and we are being equated oftentimes because of our authority position to law enforcement, although we clearly are not, and we're governed by our oath to the Constitution. Uh, for a layperson, that, that may not matter, and they may not be able to draw that distinction. Uh, I think what we've got to do is make sure that we are communicating about our, our training so that people understand. Um, most of the programs out there do a pretty good job talking to the administration, but also they, they are kind of uh, informing the student body as well that, hey, this is where the ROTC folks train. Um, we're just over here trying to get our training done, trying to advance in our class like anybody else. Uh, but there's going to be friction points with that. I mean, there was some friction with that when I was in college as well. Uh, but I, but I, think it's, um, I think it's unfortunate that we find ourselves here uh, in this position. And again, the national dialogue has got to continue with regards to law enforcement and how they interact with the American people, and I, and I firmly believe that. So um, I have a recommendation. Of course, yeah, sure. Because everyone knows we're on recruiting, and so we're literally embedded in the communities, and of course we're experiencing this. So I would ask that um, teammates that you take a look at your, um, your social media presence. You take a look at, um, are you doing um, the, you know, the live chats on, on the college radio? Are you doing podcasts with, with whatever department is um, that's focusing on maybe something that it could be music, it could be something that one of your cadets or even you are your interests and 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 not just be a department in the college, but actually be in fully embedded in it. And so we we have found um, that our, our young men and women that um, participate in the community events, uh, that our young men and women that are on the local radio or even like the, the, um, the radio show that only comes on like, you know, twice a week and that are doing podcasts and social media presence in their area. So they're not trying to reach out, you know, states away. They're, they have a very real presence in their community. And then you tell your story you tell your army story. It's very hard to distress a young man or a woman that has is giving of themselves that this is my story and this is what I've done in the army and this is what it's done for me and this is what we're doing um, you know this week at if you're doing a podcast this is what we're doing this week at um, you know for training so I, I would strongly recommend you do that if you're not doing that already. Well, let me let me circle back a little bit too, because I think I think Sir Major hit on a very important point, and that is, um, you know, we, we are distinctly different than than the police, although we sometimes get equated to police. And and I think and I think most Americans will believe that most police want to be good people, want to do the right thing, 
want to take care of uh, each other. They are as outraged, many of them, as everybody else in America based on what's happened. But there's a distinction between who they are and who we are. And we have to draw that distinction out because again, what we're doing is we want to be representative of America to protect America uh, abroad, at home when required. Uh, but, uh, but that distinction, I think, is important um, because it's two different entities and two different responsibilities and roles. Thank you. Sir, this question is for you. Being in the command, we want to say we are inclusive, but the command barely has any people of color representing the command. Shouldn't there be some type of balance? I've seen many people of color as instructors, but not officers at the headquarters, the brigades, APMSs, or PMSs for the universities. Yeah, so I, I think I'd take a little bit of issue with that. I, like I said before, I think we could do better, particularly with our officer diversity. Uh, but uh, my first year in command, I had two African-American brigade commanders, so that was 25% of, of the brigade commanders. Uh, last year, um, I had uh, one uh, who was also female. Uh, now this year, unfortunately, even though we had an African-American uh, principal who was selected for personal reasons, uh, he didn't accept the brigade command. It went to an alternate who happened to be a Caucasian male. So I have no African-American um, brigade commanders right now. Uh, as you take a look across our staff, I mean, whoever, you know, you can't see who's reading the questions tonight. My PAO is an African-American female lieutenant colonel. So we've got people on our staff and in high-ranking positions uh, that are providing context to us and diversity to our team. We can always do better. We do have a, a, a very good representation of African-American PMSs out there uh, across the force. Um, but again, we've got to do better on our officer corps of diversity. I acknowledge that, and I think we've got to get after it. And if you're not seeing it, then, uh, then maybe that's indicative of a problem that we got to address. Sergeant Major, um, you can answer this question, and sir, I would also ask you to follow up. Okay. We will be receiving some, will, will we be receiving some form of update on all of these questions and tips that people are giving in order to track the Army's process with this difficult issue? Also, um, what I would recommend is we do this at USRAC. Um, after every town hall, we, um, we post the answers to um, all the questions. And the questions that are coming in live, we have members of our staff, and I'm sure it's happening right now, taking down, making note of the questions so that we don't get to them. We can still um, post them and, um, on, on your, on your uh, dashboard so that everyone can go back and take a look at it. Now, I know that some of the questions are um, intensely personal, and those questions, um, we may be, uh, or a member of the staff may be calling you directly to answer your very personal uh, question. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so I think what I'd add there is, uh, and I think what Sergeant Major said is one part of this, right? I, I started the discussion night saying, what we want to do is start the dialogue. We, we don't want it to end with dialogue, and frankly, we don't want it to end with just the answers to questions because that's not moving the ball forward. So I think one of the things we're doing right now, the Army senior leaders are working very diligently on kind of formulating a plan for how the Army can attack this um, effectively. Uh, and it's more than just town halls and open forums. They want to be able to put real, um, real change behind this so that we can address this in the Army uh, I'd love to say once and for all, but I think this is one of those things you have to continue to attack. You just, you know, you have to continue to press the attack. So, uh, so we can absolutely do what the Sergeant Major said with regards to, you know, posting answers to the questions, even the ones that didn't get an opportunity to get asked on air. But I think we've got to also be looking to what's going to be the next level. What tangible actions can we take that are going to help us in this regard? Uh, and, uh, and we've got to build some action plans to do that. And so, Mr. Sir, I would also like to add, um, help us with this you know it's it's not it's not just your questions and, and we're giving you answers what are your ideas what do you what do you think that we should do what and what do you think that um that perhaps could be the 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 biggest change that we can make um and i would just remind everyone it, it literally takes a village to raise a child it takes an entire community to um, to help our army, and so the way we're going to get better is with your input. 
So we're asking you, um, how can we be better? So we have time for one question, one last question, and then we'll move to um, closing statements. If we were to ask the field, if we did a survey at this stage in our history, what kind of trends are we looking at? What do you feel are the top three issues directly? And I'll start with you, sir. And then if, if we were to look at the field, ask that one more time, I'm sorry. If we were to ask the field, i.e. doing a survey at this stage in our history, what kind of trends are we looking at? What do you feel would be the top three issues directly? Um, current trends for the Army, I guess, would be the question then. What, what, what three things? That's what I would assume. It's not yeah. stated. In I'm, I'm struggling a little bit, but I think, um, so I think, I think one of the trends is, um, and this is right down the Sergeant Major's lane, is that, you know, we, we rely on the American people to, to field our Army, okay? One of the very unique things about uh, our Army is that it is an all-volunteer force since 1972. So we have got to continue to engage people across the spectrum uh, of our country to be part of who we are so that we look like them and that we reflect not just our Army values but also the, the values that America holds dear. And so right now a trend is, hey, it is hard to get people to make that commitment for a number of different reasons, uh, anything from um, uh, perhaps there's distrust out there to all the way to you know the economy or the fact that people may not feel propensed to serve. So I think our, one of our trends that we've got to address is how do we continue to sustain an all-volunteer force for the future? Um, I think certainly one of the trends right now is that we're continuing to have these dialogues about uh, inequality, whether it's in the system that provides opportunity to people or the system that, that demonstrates whether or not we were equitable in that opportunity by showing us the outcomes. Uh, and I think we've got to look hard at that. So I think that's a, a trend as well. Um, and then um, lastly, I would say um, one of the really positive trends is we, we are a diverse team. So we've got work to do. We know that. We acknowledge that tonight. But as you take a look at what our Army looks like right now, um, we've got to continue to sustain the representation we've got in our Army with regards to uh, people of color, uh, gender, uh, all of the things that make us who we are. Um, now, we can slide backwards if we're not careful, and we've got to watch as our demographics in the country change, but uh, I think we are trending in a good direction with regards to our diversity and our values, and we've got to sustain that. So, uh, teammates, we need, um, between officers of sessions and list of sessions, we need about 150,000 people a year. And, um, and that, is not, that is not counting the folks that are in the Army that we need to do other things, become warrant officers, go special, um, special forces. Um, and so, um, obtaining the talent is definitely a, a challenge for us. And as General Evans stated, um, you know, we, we need to involve our communities in this and to understand the importance of having a ready army. So when you think about it, if, um, if we do not bring in new people every year, um, our army is not ready. And if our army is not ready, it cannot maintain its readiness, then, I mean, we're literally a threat to national security. So I, I think that is of utmost importance. And secondly, retaining talented people. And I, I think that is, um, that is something that we have been working on and wrapping our arms, or trying to wrap our head around for several years now and working towards um, and retaining you know, our talent. And so there are talents not leaving to go, um, to go make another organization better. And you know, whether that's the um, battalion commander's assessment, whether that's um, other assessments that the Army senior leaders are, are thinking about Im implementing, and whether it's the marketplace where you get to choose where um, you, the, the unit and you get to kind of figure out um, where it's the best place for you to go. Um, so we do have some work ahead of us, but I, I do think that um, acquiring talent and retaining talent, um, and as well as having these difficult conversations in these challenging times, whether it's COVID, 
or the, um, the challenges that we clearly have with racism, um, I believe those are the topics that would be trending. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have closing comments from our host, Sergeant Major. Well, teammates, uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me. I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, I, I just want to have a couple of things and um, not to re repeat myself too much, but um, please remember, remember about mentorship. Uh, you need to have these conversations with um, your mentors, and you need to have mentors that look like other people too, not just like you, so you can have broaden that, that conversation. Um, junior mentors, peer mentors, and senior mentors. And then I want to say something that um, I kind of um, quote a little bit what the chief of staff had said today to us after we were speaking about um, this is my squad and that we're all teammates together treating every woman with dignity and respect. We are going to um, come out of this crisis stronger, better, and even more importantly, more considerate of others. And at the, at, at the end of it all, can we really call ourselves, this is, this is me, not him anymore, but can we really call ourselves teammates if we're not treating everybody with dignity and respect? So I ask that you um, engage your mentors. If you don't have any, you need to get mentors and um, have that dialogue, have that hard conversation with, with all your teammates. Sir? Thanks, Sergeant Major. And, and once again, let me just thank you for being here tonight. Um, you, you did exactly what I hoped you would do, and that it was add depth and, uh, and different perspective and diversity to the dialogue, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, so let me just end the way I started. I talked about the fact that we were really trying to do three things tonight. The first was, was to listen. Um, and we've heard your comments, but when I said we want to listen, it wasn't just about the two of us up here listening to what you have to say. It's about all of you listening to each other. Uh, because I think that's essential if we're going to move the ball forward, if we're going to have substantive discussions about this, you've got to listen to each other respectfully and responsibly. The second thing I said we wanted to do was start a conversation. And, and by virtue of the conversation that we started tonight, encourage people uh, down trace within the, my organization, certainly within the Sergeant Majors organization, um, you know, all the way down to that squad level. You know, this is your squad, and like she said, that's a metaphor. It's your ROTC classroom, your program, your cadre, that's your squad. And I think you need to have this conversation with your squad. Uh, so we're trying to start that conversation. And lastly, I ask us to be open and honest. And so in that spirit, I'm going to say something here that uh, we didn't get to tonight in the questions, but I think it bears saying. So I'm going to say this as the white guy, okay? Uh, privilege. So uh, I used to hear about white privilege and privilege and and frankly, I didn't buy it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Uh, I thought it had something to do with where you come from, how much money you made, how affluent your parents were. And I knew that I worked hard to get where I was. My parents were good people and they worked hard, both of them, but they came from mill people. That's who their parents were. Blue collar, hard working textile people in North Carolina. So I didn't come with any privilege. I didn't ask for any privilege and I refused to accept any privilege. And then it, become, and then it dawned on me that it's really not about that. It's not about affluence, it's not about your education, it's not about how much money you make, it's about the fact that you are considered differently from, by our society than people of color. And so every time that I walk into a hotel, a restaurant, a department store, there's nobody giving me a second look. There's nobody that's gonna check to make sure I'm not picking something up and putting it in my pocket or hanging out by the cash register, but a man my age, similarly dressed, clean cut, of, of African American descent, of color can walk in and he will not get that same uh, respect. So I'm encouraging my white officers and NCOs out there to discuss amongst yourselves the concept of privilege so that you understand what it's like for people of color when they are trying to deal with these issues as a minority in our society. So I'll, I'll end on that note. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to say that and uh, thank you to all the folks that tuned in tonight those who've submitted questions on the various platforms that we asked for. Uh, this is the start of the dialogue. We want to continue it, but I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. So everyone have a good night. Leadership excellence.